Everyone, this is three questions with the AG Giuliani. My guy, long time guest. AG Giuliani is like the Tom Hanks of the podcast, right? Keeps coming back over and over again. I love it. You're like the, I don't know. It's, I think it's you, Allison Apsey, maybe Katie Martin. I don't know. It's going to be tight. You're like, I'm going for it. I'm going right. for the win. I'm going yeah. for the all time, all time record. Hey, so we're, I'm actually going to do a special three questions with AJ today. And we're going to talk about his book, Adaptable, his new book coming out in April of 2023, Meaningful and Relevant. And also we're going to do a little bit of chat GPT stuff yes. and artificial intelligence and having some of that conversation. Cause I know that's on the forefront of a lot of people's mind. And it's actually interesting because your book Adaptable ties in beautifully to that idea and that connection. But before, okay, before we get into that, I promise this year, this is something I focus on. Subscribe on YouTube, subscribe on YouTube and put a comment. Let's see what AJ, what's like a comment they should do today. And also subscribe. I'm going to be that guy. And AJ has got a question for you. What is the question? And I'm going to do it. You can win a copy of adaptable from AJ Giuliani or empower. Um, yeah. Do it. The question you got for them to put in, to put a question or a comment into YouTube. Yeah. The question would be, why are the Eagles going to win the Super Bowl? <laughs> I knew you're going to, I was like, it's going to do, he's going to do something Eagles. What's the score going to be? What do you got for a score coming up? Yeah. What is the score? I'm thinking. Yeah, I know uh, you think Eagles are going to win. Yeah. But I think it's going to be a close game. 31, 27. Okay. Ball, you know, Eagles win. Okay, so we were recording this on February 6th. This is not going to be published until March. So we're going to find out if AJ knew what he was talking about. So if he was right, okay, you all got to subscribe. Yes. And if he was wrong, just you can make some jokes just, in the just, comments. Okay. Don't cyber bully. That's it. You can, just, I, you can take it. I'm from you Philly. Can, you, can you can cyber tease. <laughs> Just don't cyber bully, okay? So don't give him too much of a hard time. Okay, so three questions with AJ. So first of all, Adaptable. That was published with Impress, so we really love doing that. It is a like bestseller with multiple... What was it a bestseller on? Wall Street Journal, USA Today. That noise was made for that book. No, it was a great launch, honestly, and we loved working with the whole team at Impress. It was awesome. I love it. So tell us, just give us a little, and we're going to put the link down below in the description wherever you're listening to or watching this podcast because you should be watching on YouTube because you are, because this is the year. I'm going to, this is the year. So tell us a little bit about the book, the idea, and a little bit, like, what do you hope that it ultimately changes in education? Yeah, I think the main focus of the book is when the pandemic happened, our curriculums weren't adaptable. Our textbooks sure weren't adaptable. Most of our constructs of the education system were adaptable. The only thing that really was the people, teachers, the school leaders, the parents, the community members were adaptable. How can we make our schools, specifically our curriculum, more adaptable and flexible, not to just change with the times, but to put kids in a position where they can help prepare themselves for anything in the future. And so the goal is really, how do you build that out? What right. does it look like? What are some of those pillars of, of curriculum to make it that way? And just sharing some really good stories and, and insights from the field of how to make that. That's one thing I really appreciate, AJ. You do a really good job of telling good stories, giving relevant examples, and then also backing it up with research articles that you share, things that you dig into. To, and it's not, I think sometimes books can be a little too researchy. I, I know that's a weird thing to say that they're very hard to read. And so you, I know that you make it really relevant. One of the things I was thinking about when you're talking about this idea of being adaptable, I work with a lot of school districts talking about their mission and vision statement. And I'll challenge them a little bit on it, right? Hey, why does it say this? Like, why doesn't it say this? So for example, easy one, they'll say, we want to do what's best for all students. I say, hey, I, there's nothing, obviously we wanna do what's best for all kids, but why don't we wanna do best for all of our people? Like, why is it just limited to students? Like, why don't, so one of the things I've challenged people say, why not say learners? Anybody willing to grow and develop? And so it puts an onus on us as the adults to continuously develop, to see ourselves in that vision, but then put something on the entire school district to focus on how do we serve the adults? How do we serve people? And so they'll agree with me. Right. They'll like, yeah, that's, that's awesome. That's a really great way to think of it. But we kind of voted that mission and vision in, so we don't really want to change it. So they're like, it's all, do you know what I mean? Like they'll actually, because it's like the process they went through 
and I get that they don't want to like just not honor the time of other people that maybe put into it. But it's like you might instead of writing that on a website, you might as have well written it on a tablet. And right. I'm not talking like an iPad. I'm talking like stone tablets, like Ten Commandment it's tablets, right? Yeah. So do we sometimes cause that issue ourselves because we're like, no, we got to stick with what we said, even though we're watching everything change in front of us, right? Like, how do you see that kind of happening at the leadership level? Yeah, I think that's a big piece of the issue with schools is that a lot of these things that we write in the stone, to use right. your words, yeah. need to be organic. We talk about in education all the time how the world keeps on changing. We got to change with it. And yet our policies, our curriculum, a lot of these documents that actually dictate what people do on a daily basis in schools every single day aren't organic, aren't adaptable, aren't flexible. Right. And so why would we not write that into policy that we can, being leaders, use our best discretion to change and improve and improvise on those things as needed? It has to be that. In 2023 and beyond, we have to make just a standard in most schools. Curriculum should be written on Google Docs. That's something I've been arguing forever. They should be written on Google Docs that you can update as oh, needed. Yeah. And even one of the things that I used to say is, as an administrator, we really try to didn't focus on rules, but really principles. And one thing I said, make the best decision for the kids in front of you. Right. So if you are like, that's the rule, that's the rule. You put people in sometimes a bad, they, you put sometimes people in a situation to follow the rule against the best interest of the kid. Right. right. Yeah. So that's a, I think that's a really important aspect and puts people in a situation to be successful, which is really important. So this actually leads into kind of the second question. And I don't know if it's really a question, maybe just give an overall view. A lot of conversation about chat GPT, artificial intelligence. And one of the arguments I've made is that there's a lot of people that all of a sudden are chat GPT experts. I'm like, you're not a chat GPT expert, right? Mm -hmm. But what I think really the misconception is that there's a lot of people that are really good at learning and as the title of your book, adaptable, adapting to new situations, right? Figuring out. And one of my favorite quotes from you, AJ, goes along the lines, and you'll correct me on this because I'm not going to say it perfectly right, is that we don't need to prepare students for something, but we need pre to prepare students for anything, right? What's a quote from you? What is it? How is it? Yeah, our job as teachers, as parents, is not to prepare students for, it's to help them prepare themselves for anything, right? So they should be the ones preparing themselves for the future. Right. And so I love that quote from you. And I think it's a really important aspect because that is something that I've been arguing for a long time nobody knows what the future holds in education. And so people are making these like focuses on whatever. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of misconception that it doesn't mean kids shouldn't read or anything like this, blah, blah, blah. I think that's such a terrible argument. It's actually building beyond that. Of course we want kids to read, but we also want them to be able to adapt to new situations because if you're not willing to do that, you're going to become irrelevant at some point. And the only way to not become irrelevant is to be able to willing to continuously grow, which is the business of schools, in my opinion, or it should be at least. So when you're looking at chat GPT, AI, what's maybe some of the opportunities that you see for educators right now utilizing some of these things and maybe not just in their learning, but even in their own personal lives? Yeah, I think first and foremost, it's just a reality that is going to continue to impact us right now and in the future. It's already impacting us, but even more so, right, in the coming months and years and that type of thing. The big shift for me is that we've always had the ability to access information. Now we have this ability for creative out, and that's the game changer, right? So we always could go to Google and get the information to write a paper, but we had to synthesize it, we had to break it down, we had to recap, evaluate, all that kind of stuff. Now we could just have an AI write that paper. They do all the synthesizing and creative output themselves. Given that reality, and it is impacting all kinds of fields, I think we have to take a deep look at how we assess. So for example, if you're a math teacher and you give a math test and you only assess getting the final question right, getting the actual answer, right. you can use a calculator, they can use photomath, they could do anything, you're not really assessing the learning. Same thing goes for being an English teacher, a humanities teacher, you assign a writing and they use ChatGPT. That isn't what learning should be about. That's not what assessment should be about. So I think it's calling on a lot of people to change a little bit of their practices of how we assess learners and actually looking at the learning process. So how people can use it is in so many different ways. I've seen teachers already 
using it for lesson plans, using it for smart goals, right. for IP modifications and accommodations, all kinds of things that would take them a lot of time. And this is giving them ideas or starting points. I've seen students using it for starting points of their college essay, for writing scripts and video and storyboards for things they're going to create. It's like the best study, research, or partner to any project you've ever had because they're always going to be there and they're always going to give you feedback and ideas along the way. And I think that's how we should view it as an assistant to the learning process, not someone who's just going to replicate. Yeah. And that, that, but AJ, it's not like we're going to be just carrying calculators in our pockets. <laughs> exactly. Right? We're not just going to be carrying calculators in our pockets. It's like the schools that have blocked it. I understand. Immediately. You know, it might not be COPA compliant, but it's on the kids' phones. You can't block it on there. Yeah. They probably use ChatGPT. ChatGPT, how do you block ChatGPT at our school? So the one of the best analogies of this that I heard was from a, a gentleman I know we both watch, Minority Mindset, talks a lot about financial fluency and literacy and something we're both really passionate. He talked about ChatGPT being like a second brain. And I just love that and I, the argument, you remember Khan Academy, people were like, oh my God, Khan Academy is gonna place teachers. I'm like, not me, I don't teach like that. That's a totally, that's the most boring, like it, it's a supplement, right? And so no teacher that really gets kids to really think of their own learning and how they make their own connections and understanding. And I, I just wrote a, an email this week talking about what, like we have to start defining what learning is and what we mean by that. Cause a lot of times you talk about the Hattie research, people bring that up and stuff like that. I'm like, did that improve learning or test scores? Because, cause really, and I'm not saying like, there's not nothing of value in that research, but they use it like, and they say learning. I'm like, how did you measure learning? How did you measure that? Did you just look at what test scores improved? Cause maybe like you could teach the test and get kids really good at test, but they don't want to figure out anything other than how to like do well on the test. And so seeing as that second brain, I, one of the things when I do the epic book reviews, and I don't know, have you seen any of the epic book reviews? Have you seen my epic book reviews? No. What? Yeah. You've been, because I actually, the reason I asked you, and I'm trying to find it, is I have literally the best theme song for the epic book review. And since I mentioned it, you get to hear it. <laughs> That's the epic book review. I feel like I'm, yeah. Epic. I'm it's epic. Yeah. Right? So when I started doing the epic book reviews, I would actually read the whole book. And then I would write some quotes that really resonate with me, some stories. But then I go to chat GPT and say, Hey, write a summary of the book in five tweets. Right? So it was my way of saying, make this as succinct as possible. And so I would say, Hey, I got this from chat GPT. Just like I say, I got this from Wikipedia. Right? And it is that second brain. So I think seeing it that way, there's potential possibilities. If you're seeing it as a replacement, that's where, and then it's as you're talking about, then maybe kids don't see what we're doing as relevant. And it's, you have to help them find their own connections and understanding and why it actually matters. I think that's something that ties in beautifully to the title of your next book, which yes. is meaningful and what a segue, what a segue. That was like, you drew it up. You drew it up. I like did. That was actually meaningful and relevant with the whole word. And spelled just drew it up. Give me the sign. It was beautiful. Give me the sign. What's the and sign called? Is it just called the and sign? Yes, it's a. It's actually called an ampersand. Is it ampersand? Yeah. Really, that's weird. Ampersand and is an ampersand. Something, yeah. A little trivia for you there. Okay, yeah. so I don't know if that's true or just a dumb thing I said. <laughs> so tell us about this book that's coming up in April of 2023. The the book really comes from I think a place of being a teacher, being an educator, but also being a learner and being a dad to five kids right now who are all learners in school as well. And just seeing the difference between what they normally go through on a day-to-day -day basis at school versus when they have those moments of meaningful and relevant learning, when they light up, they're excited, they're engaged and I get to talk with a lot of teachers around the country, just like you, and ask them, like, what's the best learning experience you've had with kids over the past year? Every single time, it's something that's meaningful and relevant. Every single time. And if you ask, hey, what was the best learning experience that you had when you were in school? Every single time, it's something meaningful and relevant. And what I mean by those two words is meaningful, that it has just some type of mattering to their lives in some way, shape, or form. It could be take a lot of different forms. And relevant, meaning that they see how it connects their lives to the world around them, what's going on, that type of thing. 
And when we are just talking about a world where every single kid has this in their pocket, in their face. They're not going to have a calculator in their pocket. Yeah, we're, we're, we're constantly distracted. I would say everybody's distracted. Adults, kids, whoever. Yeah. We are going to lose the attention battle 99 times out of 100 if we continue in schools and education just trying to get their attention through grades, carrots, and sticks. We're just going to lose the attention battle. Yeah. So we have to fight back with meaningful and relevant learning experiences. It's really the only way to engage in 2023 and beyond. Love it. So a couple of things. The, when you're talking about lose the attention, I think we have to, as adults, practice having better attention spans. One thing I've really tried to do is just read physical books. Yeah. I know that sounds like a weird thing, but I've never been a big reader and I've especially not read physical books. And part of it is because I travel so much, it's easier to carry a ton of books, Kindle, but as soon as Kindle is notification, something distracted, whereas I find a quiet place, I read this and you like on Instagram, you see the like head popping, like the head popping, right? Cause they're just trying to get your attention and stuff like that. And it's like people on a, oh, and people like will say really extreme stuff to get attention, right? Cause who cares about middle stuff, right? That's boring. Like I need to say something that really gets people excited or mad and that, and so I think that actually we complain about this a lot about all oh, these kids I'm like about adults are sucked into this stuff too. Right? Like, I'm sure you're the same way. I, a lot of less people read my blog than what used to. Yeah. Cause sure. it's longer. Cause it's long. There's yeah. actually, do you know what I mean? But if I post something on Instagram, it's, oh, that's super quick. And then I can just scroll to the next thing. And so are we as adults causing some of that issue? Meaningful, relevant. I, I'm a big history buff, especially like World War II. And I actually was thinking about this as you were talking. When I was in high school, we did this simulation game in our social studies class. And basically we were these like fake countries and you were in charge of a fake country. And basically you had to make like decisions every day. And basically you like found out this country did this thing, this country did this thing. What are you going to do? And basically it was a, it was an activity that ended when it ended. And what I meant by that was when did world war three break out? And the teacher said they never made it past six days Wow! because basically we, people would make decisions that would always lead to war. And it was like getting people to see what happens when people get power and what are they doing? I'll never forget that. It was like a really, and it always stuck with me and it like made me like study like history and kind of understanding that. And I remember how powerful that was. And I can't remember the name of the countries, like, cause they're all fake names. I can't, I, but I remember how much that sparked in me to actually want to learn about that stuff after the fact, which I think is like the sign of a great teacher is not what, what necessarily kids learn in your classroom. It's what they're inspired to learn after they leave, whether that's at that night, whether that's after their time with you in total, I think there's some power for that. So I'm like looking forward to that book. So yeah, yeah that, that, everybody has an experience like that, by the way, George, like, right. everybody has an experience like that. I was just talking to a teacher. I have a bunch of teachers that are writing stories and vignettes for the book. One teacher tells a story about how when she was in school, they turned their entire classroom into the rainforest because they're right. studying rainforest. They all came in. They were finally done. And the teacher like lit like a little fire in the classroom. She said, I oh, couldn't do this anymore, but she like lit a little fire. And she went to hold it over and burn like part of the, and the kids were freaking out. We but like, and then boom, teachable. It mattered to them. It was meaningful. The experience was relevant. Now they could see right. oh, when this burning of the rain, this is how people feel. Like those things stick with kids. They stick with us as adults. And we also want to do more of them. And so the book is also about how can we do more of this given our constraints that we have with standards, curriculum, scope and sequence, that type of thing. Because I think most people want to do more of those things. They just don't know how. It's almost like they have to innovate. Just inside the box. Inside the box. <laughs> inside the box. <laughs> and then so. inside the box. All right. So AJ, thanks so much for your time today. AJ and I, obviously we get along very well, very good friends. For many years, we were talking about like one of the first times we met. And it's like, I, I remember walking outside one time and that was the first time I met you and just thinking like how many years later, you know, how different things are. And like, when you say you have five kids, that's as of today, like it could be six or seven. You just, you got kids <laughs> just happening nonstop. Can't even keep up. 
Yeah, I think we're done. We, we got to start. Right, with right. we gotta well, start with you five. say that, but this is not being released for a month, so who knows? I think you had four of the last podcast, maybe three. <laughs> right, the right. Just, were just new uh, kids every time. And I got to hang out with your kids just recently. That was wonderful. Yes. I can't wait for the book to be released. And instead of ending with a theme song, the regular theme song for three questions, we're going to give you one of these. That's good. And this is for, and we'll see. The Sixers theme song. That's we'll see. Oh, my <laughs> God. All right. Make sure you follow AJ and hopefully good luck to your Eagles this week. It's going to be a big game. So everyone, thanks for listening. AJ, thanks for your time. I hope you all have a wonderful day.